Well, I spoke to David Letterman about you. <laughs> you did? <laughs> I did. Wow, I actually am like getting uh, chills on the back of my neck. I wanted to do this series called The Art of the Interview, which is basically about the art of conversation, but much more I wanted to speak to people that I truly admire, and I truly admire you. Drew, thank you so much. That means the world to me. I, I you know, I'm very humbled. And, uh, you know, when anybody recognizes the show, I'm blown away. But to hear something like that from someone like you is really special. What you have come onto the scene with and been on the scene for a, a, a while now is just the most fresh concept. It's so exciting for people. It's so brilliant. It's so deliciously manipulative. It's such fun chaos. The thing that really astonishes me also is you are the straight man. You maintain your cool. You let everything burn, pun intended, and be the circus around you. And you are this calm water conductor. Yeah, I would, uh, I'd kind of agree with that. You know, like to us, we just want the hot sauces to be a disruptive element, but a background character to the whole show. Like we really are a classic interview show, like in every sense of the word. And then this is just supposed to be something to take a celebrity guest and knock them right out of that PR driven flight pattern. But otherwise we just sort of completely ignore this absurd premise where we have wings on the table and everything like that. As someone on that side of it, that's also why I'm so excited for your show and what you do, because I can promise you with every fiber of my being and my entire heart right out to you, people who have to do press or interviews, we are so desperate for something fun. And so when you sit down for an interview, it tends to feel like you're trying so hard to uh, be real or funny or, you know, and you just get this, I need an anecdote and the plug. And the fact that you have to earn your plug on your show is just such a you know what to the system. Thank you very much. And I think too, like even from your perspective, you know, we have a big ask when we're on the show because we're asking you to eat a wing that's like soaked in some of the hottest hot sauces ever made. But for us, we think that would be unfair if we weren't at least, you know, thoughtful and career spanning in the interview. Because how are you, as somebody, you know, who has a movie out, how are you motivated to keep going on in the interview unless you have someone who's meeting you halfway? So like when we first started the show, we didn't have like high aspirations for the show necessarily. We thought we could be like a funny internet sideshow thing going on. But what ended up happening is we had this cult audience that was coming every single week. So that really pushed us to make a better show. And then the other side of it was thinking about, you know, the celebrity coming in here to do this. It's maybe been doing press all week. And this is like the 25th interview, you know, like how do we make it fresh? Because ultimately, I think that if the guest is kind of, you know, maybe not up to it on that day on that show, I kind of look at it as my fault. So from like, uh, from being prepped, from being prepared, from being organized. Like we really take a lot of pride in that and want our guests to come through and feel like that was the most comfortable, least comfortable interview that I've done on this tour. I find your research so impeccable. And I believe you're a fan of Howard Stern. Is this true? I love Howard Stern and Letterman. Those to me are like the two best to ever do it. Well, I spoke to David Letterman about you. <laughs> you did? <laughs> I did. He said that what you're doing is so unique and so rare and such a conceptual thing that people can get behind. And he, uh, he spoke very, very highly of it and you. Wow, I actually am like getting uh, chills on the back of my neck. When I was like a little kid, uh, my dad would let me watch Letterman. And I remember when I did like the first big late night show I did was Colbert. And you know, you see like the Ed Sullivan theater and all the things about like how cold it is. And then you're actually backstage there and it's all happening. And then a lot of the same people that like worked on Letterman, like still work on Colbert, you know, but they just have like normal jobs backstage there. And you're like, oh my God, that's Biff. You know what I mean? Like it was just such a surreal experience. So like you telling me that I'm, I'm like fluttering right now. One of the reasons 
I really wanted to talk to you was because Howard Stern is such a, a guide to me on journalism. And, you know, he, he used to torture me when I was a teenager. He'd have my mom on the show and be like, Drew, call your mom. And I was like, oh my God, you are literally scratching at my emotional Achilles heel on your smut show and you don't know the history here and how bad this is hurting me and you're just all about sensationalism and ratings and shock and really you're breaking my heart here and i can't believe that someone i hated so much would become my journalistic icon and i think he is the most well researched he asks the most personal, interesting questions, and he's actually one of now the safest people to speak to. I think that he has like the best sort of nose for what people want to know, what people want to hear. I do this show with a partner, Chris Schoenberger, and, and we yin yang creatively so perfectly. Like I kind of feel like all my life I've been looking for the Chris, and Chris has been looking for me, and then they mesh kind of perfectly. But I think that Howard Stern is like the epitome of that. Like his sense, his compass on like what his audience wants to hear about is so perfect. But I don't think that you can develop that type of gut if you are not a very hardworking, learned, study or researcher. How do you yeah. do your research? Well, like for us, what we do is we just take advantage of as much time as we have. So it's like, all right, we hear that Drew Barrymore is coming in in a week. All right, gotta do, gotta read the memoirs, gotta read the books. It's uh, me, uh, Chris Schoenberger, and then my little brother, Gavin. I've put him to work. And we kind of divide up everything. Like, who's taking podcasts and, like, YouTube interviews? Like, who's taking the books? Who's taking all the magazine articles? And along the way, we've found, like, a couple little tricks where it's, like, we'll really dig into the regional newspapers of wherever that person is from because, like, that beat newspaper is going to cover them and know them in a different way than sort of, like, the national media and press like there are little things like that that we've picked up along the way or I look at body language a lot so if like you know I'm watching a Drew Barrymore interview I can see maybe like a person started to scratch at the surface of something you want to talk about but then they speed right by it and then I can kind of see like oh there was like an interest there there was like a thing that like almost caught the hook like the fish almost caught the hook but didn't so that's something that maybe I'll dig in a little bit deeper and I think it was just through the experience of like doing this show for five years now, 12 seasons and hundreds of different celebrity guests that you kind of pick up these little things along the way, these little hacks that kind of like help you make the run of show. But it all comes down to like, you're exactly right, is I think really caring. You know, one of the things that motivates me is sort of like a fear of embarrassment, a fear of humiliation. And I remember when I was in college at the University of Illinois, I was doing some like broadcast journalism project and like boil orders like here comes this person from like the city government answering my questions about boil orders and they're just doing that because I'm a student and here I am I have no idea what I'm talking about I'm wasting their time and I can see it in that person's face and I remember going home and feeling like so horrible about it because here was a person who was kind of just like doing a favor for a kid who needed to do an assignment something they didn't have to do they probably just believe in the educational process and want to do what's right. And then here I was kind of like disrespecting their time. So I remember like having that feeling and being like, I'm never going to have that feeling again. And I think that that has, you know, manifested itself in this show a lot. And then, and then what ends up happening is, you know, you become a victim of your own success now where it's like, all right, you do this for a long time. Now you have this audience expectation. So you can't stop, like you can't stop doing it. Uh, but thankfully, like, it's my favorite part of the whole process is doing the research and walking a mile in someone else's shoes and watching the movies or like listening to their records or reading their books and stuff. And it, it keeps things like fresh and interesting because uh, Hot One serves as kind of like an extension of the guest personality. You know, it's not like the Sean Evans show or like the Wings show. It kind of allows the guests to fill that space naturally. What's so interesting to me is I so agree with everything you just said. Like I have my, you know, this is just, I, but I study it so much that I, my preference is to never have to reference it. But in my mind, I know the beats and where I want to connect to, but I try to let the conversation, uh, dictate where and when I'm going to find those ornaments. The conversation is the Christmas tree and the questions are the ornaments. 
Um, and I know I'm going to try to place them, but I'm not sure when and where. I just have it all in here. And the only reason I like to fly and not look is because I know I did my homework. Yeah, 100%. And then too, I think like, as long as you have that structure there, that's great. But ultimately, like what it comes down to is, is listening to the other person and kind of going wherever that thing's going to go. Like one of the things that I've realized is like when you're doing interviews, you're not obligated to offer that much. You're not obligated to give those answers and do those things. You know, it's sort of a trust exercise where I kind of have to like get that out of you or like make you feel comfortable enough to do it or like trust me enough to go there or like trust the show enough especially like you know you've kind of been clickbaited your whole life like you were clickbaited like before clickbait was even a thing but now it's like something you have to you have to like be conscious of too and like in in the sort of day and age that we live in so i think it's important to have that structure but also like listen because if that person feels comfortable it's like i've used this analogy before but like a cat will always like let you know where it likes to get pet like that whole thing about like kind of doing that with the guests and kind of going that direction and <laughs> having and having that and having that uh <laughs> i just i love that i have cats and i know exactly what you're talking about and it is a dance it's a nuance and there's a great saying that nan I think she's like your Chris. So Nan taught me this quote, which is, insecurity is loud, confidence is quiet. And somehow with your amazing journalistic integrity and instincts, you also know when to step back and let it happen and go quiet. Well, thank you very much. You know, like one time I was talking to Michael Sayre on the show because it was a thing that I noticed just from like these like press junket interviews where it's like you kind of as the guest have to match the gigawatt energy of whoever you're talking to all the time. You know what I mean? But I never want it to be like you have to match my energy. Like this is the Sean show and we put you through this thing. Like I think it's much better to just sit back and let people fill the space of this studio like with whatever their energy is like i think honestly that's why this show has lasted as long as it has because this looks like a public access like 80s tv show set it's just wings and this in this bald guy but the thing that has made it interesting is that the viewer experience always takes on the personality of whoever's in that seat and then when you bring in an array of personalities then you have a different viewer experience every single time. So philosophically, that's kind of how I approach it. But that is confidence. Thank you. May I ask how you came to decide to have the set look like this? It was just out of necessity. Like we didn't have two dimes to run together. So for us, we were just like, all right, like what's the cheapest, easiest, like most simple way that we can do this. But then it ended up having an, a, like just a unintentional byproduct of that is it made our show more competitive. Like what ended up happening was with this just sort of stripped down budget set, we can travel and do the show wherever. Like we don't have to have like a locked in sort of studio thing. So, you know, we've traveled to London for shoots, like all over the country. We'll set up like, we'll like rent a suite at the Four Seasons, set this thing up. And then Charlize Theron, when she's doing like her junket downstairs, can just take the elevator up and do the show. So we didn't, we, at first, we're just sort of like, this is all we have, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Like, I don't think this show is better with a bigger budget. And this stripped down budget set is what has made the show what it is, honestly. That's the exact type of work ethic I have. I will go anywhere I'm needed to go. I will get that thing. I will do that thing. I will show up. I will travel. I don't care what it takes. You guys have this butterfly net and you want to go catch butterflies. And if it takes running across the globe in order to find those butterflies, well, then so be it. I love the spirit of we will do whatever it takes to get it. Yeah, I think that I'm, I'm obsessed with like the process of making the thing. And then once the thing is made, I kind of lose whatever attachment that I had to it. Because you can drive yourself insane trying to like chase down or like define what everything is or should be for the people who are watching it. Like, do you feel that way about, a, about like making a movie? Is it like uh, create the thing, make the thing, put it out in the world and then make the next thing? Or how long do you sort of like linger on it? I'm like probably just starting to let go of things like in my 40s, but no, I obsessed about everything. I looked in the rearview mirror about everything. 
again, Nan, I'm no Oprah, but she's my Gail and has been for 25 years. And she would always say, why do you do that to yourself? Make a decision and never look back. You've made it. You're done. It's over. You can't even change it if you wanted to. So why are you going to sit and fester? And I'm like, I'm, I'm just not as evolved as you are. I want to get there one day. I will get there one day. And I've always known um, that with all of my follies and growing pains and figuring things out, I always knew to follow um, people that I would like to grow up and be like one day. I never followed jackasses. I had jackass friends. I was a jackass. But to me, this moment is all about getting to have like a brain picking session with someone who I've watched as someone who is a creator and a producer going, how did you guys nail this one like this? It's so brilliant and it's so well earned and it's all yours and it's all you guys and it is fresh and it is so complex, huh, pun intended, to come up with something that is a immediate straightforward idea. People think you have to go so big in your concept to be big and you guys had this clear idea and that's where it grew from. And it's just so cool. Well, th thank you so much. Like, I really feel like I could, uh, I could talk to you all day. And I know you're a, a little bit new to being on this side of the table, but immediately drew like uh, very warm, very comfortable, like very easy to talk to. And I'm maybe not as uh, trained as a guest, you know, like I am more of a host and maybe like part of me wants to like keep the ball up in the air all the time and like obsess and like try to take control. But this was like a, a, a real treat for me. And, and uh, thanks for talking to Dave about me. And, and uh, immediately I you got a friend of me. I wish, I wish the quarantine wasn't here. So I'd just give you a hug, you know? Me too. I know what it takes to carve this time out. It's hard to make it all happen. So thank you so much for making this happen. Thank you, Sean. Drew, always got time for you. Anything for you. You can do this for as long as you want to do it. You're amazing.